In 1985, Joseph McBride was in the library of California State University San Bernardino, researching for a book about the movie director Frank Capra. McBride took time off to go through reels of microfilm documents related to the FBI and the JFK assassination. A particular memo caught his eye, and he leaned in for a closer look. It was a memorandum from FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, dated November 29, 1963. Under the subject heading, Assassination of President John F. Kennedy, it related to the intelligence reports regarding the effects of JFK assassination on Cuban exiles in Miami. Hoover reported that, on the day after JFK's murder, the Bureau had provided two individuals with briefings. One was Captain William Edwards of the Defense Intelligence Agency. The other, Mr. George Bush of the Central Intelligence Agency. McBride couldn't believe himself. Was this Vice President George H. W. Bush working in CIA in 1963, dealing with Cubans? When Bush was named CIA director in 1976, his primary merit point had been the fact that he was not a part of the agency during the coups, attempted coups, and murder plots around the world. Embarrassing information was being disclosed every day in Senate hearings before the Church Committee. The appointment of Bush as the CIA director came as a part of the so-called Halloween Massacre. For Bush, there had been much damage to control. The decade from 63 to 73 had seen one crisis after another. President Gerald Ford, who had ascended to the office when Richard Nixon resigned, fired William Colby, the director of the CIA, who was perceived by hardliners as too accommodating to congressional investigators. Ford named George H. W. Bush to take over the CIA. But Bush seemingly had no experience in sphere of intelligence. He seemed wholly unqualified for such a position, especially at a time when the agency was under maximum scrutiny. How would he restore public confidence in a tarnished spy agency? No one seemed to know. Or did Gerald Ford realize something most others didn't? In 1985, McBride did not immediately follow up this curious lead as he was busy with other things. By 1988, as George H. W. Bush prepared to assume his role as Reagan's heir to the presidency, McBride decided to dig into it. He picked up the phone and called the White House. He talked to Stephen Hart, a vice presidential spokesman. Hart denied that his boss had been the man mentioned in the memo, quoting Bush that he was in Houston, Texas at the time and involved in the independent oil drilling business. He was also running for the Senate in late 63. It must have been another George Bush. Hart further responded that Bush had never worked for CIA before becoming its director in 76 and did not receive any briefing by FBI on Cuban exiles and JFK assassination. McBride called the CIA. A spokesman for the agency, Bill Devine, quite formally responded the inquiry that he can neither confirm nor deny whether the person in question is indeed Vice President Bush. He further said that CIA has a standard policy of not confirming that anyone is involved in the CIA. McBride's revelations appeared in the July 16, 1988 issue of the liberal magazine, The Nation. Under the headline, The Man Who Wasn't There, George Bush, CIA Operative, It turns out that there was actually another George Bush who was working in CIA at that time. CIA spokesperson Sharon Basso told the Associated Press that the CIA believed that the FBI document apparently referred to a George William Bush who had worked in 1963 on the night shift at the Langley, Virginia headquarters, and that would have been the appropriate place to have received such an FBI report. George William Bush, she said, had left the CIA in 1964 to join the Defense Intelligence Agency. However, 
Basso told reporters that the agency had been unable to locate the other George Bush. Unlike CIA, McBride had no trouble finding George William Bush. By 1988, this George Bush was working as a claims representative for the Social Security Administration. He explained to McBride that he had worked only briefly at the CIA as a GS-5 probationary civil servant, analyzing documents and photos during the night shift. Moreover, he said, he had never received interagency briefings. George William Bush acknowledged under oath as part of a deposition in a lawsuit brought by a nonprofit group seeking records on Bush's past, that he was the junior officer on a three to four man watch shift at CIA headquarters between September 1963 and February 1964, which was on duty when Kennedy was shot. He did not receive any oral communications from any government agency of any nature whatsoever and is not the Mr. George Bush of the Central Intelligence Agency referred to in the memorandum. In 1945, George H. W. Bush entered Yale University. The university was welcoming back countless veterans of the OSS to its faculty. Bush, with naval intelligence work already under his belt by the time he arrived at Yale, would have been seen as a particularly prime candidate for recruitment. After graduating from Yale, Bush headed out to visit Henry Neal Mallon, who was a good friend of the Bush family, at Dresser Industries headquarters, which were then in Cleveland. Dresser was well known in the right circles as providing handy cover to CIA operatives. Bush was transferred to California. In California training for Dresser, Bush, the pregnant Barbara, and little George W. were constantly on the go, with at least five residences in a period of nine months. Bush was often absent, according to Barbara, even from their brief tenure outposts. Bush would so effectively obscure his life that even some of his best friends seemed to know little about what he was actually doing. In 1950, Dresser was completing a corporate relocation to Dallas, which, besides being an oil capital, was rapidly becoming a center of the defense industry and its military industrial energy elite. In 1953, Bush joined forces with brothers, Hugh and Bill Lidkey, to form Zapata Petroleum. Bush got money from Mallon and his maternal uncle, George Herbert Walker. As per an internal memo of CIA dated November 29, 1975, Zapata Petroleum began in 1953 through Bush's joint efforts with Thomas J. Devine, a CIA staffer who had resigned his position that same year to go into private business, but who continued to work for the CIA under commercial cover. Devine would later accompany Bush to Vietnam in late 1967 as a cleared and winning commercial asset of the agency. Zapata Offshore, a subsidiary of Zapata Petroleum, was launched by Bush in 1954. The company mainly operated in the Caribbean, Central America, and the Gulf of Mexico. In 1959, Bush bought out the Zapata Offshore and moved his family and office to Houston, Texas. Now, I am not going to make any observations about the Zapata Offshore here but the company's operations are very suspicious. Some would say that it was a CIA front focusing mainly on Cuba, playing its role in the Bay of Pigs invasion. But I will leave it up to viewers here to look it up and try to find anything interesting if they can. Coming back to 1963, Bush was doing oil business in Texas. He was the chairman of the Harris County, Houston, Republican Party and was campaigning for a seat in the Senate. There is a lot of controversy about the whereabouts of Bush on the day of JFK assassination. He was somewhere in Texas, doing something, but exactly where and doing what? Well, as it turns out, he was in Tyler, delivering a speech in the local Kiwanis Club. He was campaigning for Senate so he had to travel all over the state. In fact, Bush was in Dallas on the preceding night, 
where he spoke to a gathering of the American Association of Oil Drilling Contractors, AAODC, at the Sheraton Hotel. He flew to Tyler in a private plane of Joe Zeppa of Tyler-based Delta Drilling Company on the morning of on 22nd, November 1963. The most interesting bit is that there is an FBI memo which states that George H. W. Bush called in the FBI Bureau in Houston on 1.45 p.m. on 22nd of November 1963, just 45 minutes after the president is pronounced dead, and reported a guy named James Parrott, who he recalled as having expressed his intention to kill JFK. The FBI memo clearly states that this guy who called to give this tip was George H. W. Bush, president of Zapata offshore, and he was calling from Tyler. There is no doubt that this George Bush is exactly the same guy who later served as CIA director, vice president, and the president. It is also quite interesting that this guy James Parrott was a Republican himself, and Bush was the chairman of the Harris County Republican Party. When an FBI agent paid Mr. Parrott a visit, a certain Mr. Kearney Reynolds provided an alibi for Parrott and told the agent that he was with Parrott between 1.30 and 1.45 p.m. at his home. This Mr. Kearney Reynolds was actually a paid employee of Harris County Republican Party, which means that a subordinate of Bush was with James Parrott at his house at the time Bush was tipping off FBI about Parrott. Why did Bush do this? Perhaps to create an alibi for himself by putting on the record that he was in Tyler at the time of JFK's assassination and not in Dallas, and at the same time making sure that James Parrott gets off the hook easily as well. When a journalist approached Bush's office for confirmation of the information in the memo, Bush's aide responded that Bush doesn't recall making such a call. Quite an extraordinary thing to forget. The memo further states that Bush said that he was proceeding to Dallas, will stay at the Sheraton Hotel, and will return to his home on the 23rd.